This is going to be an overview of the book of Ezra. This book has 10 chapters, 280 verses, and 7,441 words. Ezra, as it says in Ezra 7 and verse 1, is the grandson of Hilkiah. And Hilkiah is the priest who found the book of the law in 2 Chronicles 34, 14. And you'll see something interesting is Ezra is a true Bible man. And so it's not strange that his great-great-grandfather is the one who found the book of the law in 2 Chronicles 34, 14. And I'm sure you know men who have a unique love for the book that most saints don't have. Ezra would be one of those people. And the thing that stands out about the book of Ezra is that he actually isn't mentioned until chapter 7. But the key verse of this book is chapter 2 and verse 1, which says, Now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity, of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away unto Babylon, and came again into Jerusalem and Judah, every one into his city. So Ezra picks up where Second Chronicles leaves off. You'll see that the first three verses of Ezra are like the last two verses in Second Chronicles. And in Ezra, what you have is the Jews coming back to the land after a 70-year captivity to rebuild the house of the Lord. So in this book, you have accounts of the events connected with the temple. And in chapters 1 through 6 of the book of Ezra, you have the return to Jerusalem under Zerubbabel. Then in chapters 7 through 10, you have the return under Ezra. A great lesson you can find in the Bible is that people, especially kings, are often stirred up to do things by the Spirit of God and also by the Spirit of the devil. This, however, doesn't go against their free will. But you'll see this in Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So who is there among you of all this people, of all his people, is God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. So the Lord stirred up. The Lord stirred him up to do this. Whether or not Cyrus was a saint or not, I'm not sure of that. However, the Lord will use lost or wicked men to fulfill what he wants done. And the Lord will allow the devil to, spear up, to, uh, to stir up things in certain men. Maybe he'll use the devil to stir up an adversary against his people as a judgment on his people. But in chapter 2, you have a long list of the exiled people who returned from captivity in Babylon. And to many people, they will call this a boring read. However, in the middle of all these names, you have a nugget in there. In Ezra 2.13, it says, The children of Adonikim, 666. So, Adonikim here has 666 children. The number associated with the Antichrist. It is the number of the beast. And Adonikim is a type of Antichrist. So then you go to chapter 3 and see how they built an altar to the Lord God and offered burnt offerings. It says in chapter 3 verses 1 and 2, And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua the son of Josedek, and his brethren the priests, and Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings their own, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they were going by the book. And Ezra, and you'll find people in this, in this book are men of the book who go by the book. They believe the words. Ezra 3.3, 3, And they set the altar up on his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries, and they offered burnt offerings their own unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. 
And they did this as it was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they went by the book. This shows me that they didn't just have one day a week where they thought about God, but worshipped in morning and evening. They offered burnt offerings morning and evening. In the evening, get everything ready for the next day. And it will make it easier for you to spend time with God in the morning. Lay out your clothes in the evening. Pack your lunch at night and take a shower at night. Have your Bible laid out on your desk where you are going to study in the morning. And then get up about an hour and a half to two hours early in the morning. Get your clothes on that you've already got laid out. And study until it's time to leave for work. Start your morning out with God. What you do in the evening can help you spend time, more time with God in the morning. And in chapter 3, you also see how they laid the foundations of the new temple with financial help from the Persian king. In Ezra 3, 6, and 7, it says, From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters, and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and to them of Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. So God will provide if you're doing what makes, if you're doing what's right. God will provide. Now also, see they use music. In Ezra 3, 10 through 11, it says, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by chorus and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout, and they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So I believe the Lord loves music. I believe he loves instruments. In Revelation, you see they have instruments in heaven. And if God lets them have instruments in heaven... I think he'd be all right with you using them during church time, contrary to what the Church of Christ may teach. And something also interesting is some of the ancient men who had seen Solomon's temple wept when they saw the new temple. If you look at verses 12 and 13, it says, But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men, that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. So I used to think the people were weeping here because they were happy, but it seems they were weeping because they knew things used to be better. And they saw that even though God could restore people, God could restore them, things would never be as good as they would have been had they not got off into sin. And a lot of older men today have seen the good old days and old-time preachers, and they've seen old-time old morals <clears throat> and all the old-fashioned ways when they were at their best and they look at things today and say it ain't like it used to be then the younger generation has never seen anything better than what's going on now so one day today will be the good old days and things will continue to get worse and never be like they used to be this is because of sin and the degeneration of man evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived things don't get better they get worse Men don't get more godly, they get more ungodly. Everything's running down. But in chapter 4, you're going to see how people can't mind their own business. They see you doing something good and can't stand it and want to ruin it for the people who work hard. So they pretend to seek God. But as Paul talks about in Philippians 2.21, he says, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. But in Ezra chapter 4, in verse 1, it says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they come to Zerubbabel, and the 
and to the chief of the fathers, and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God. And obviously they really don't. It says, For we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Asharhaddon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus the king of Persia hath commanded us. So this shows discernment on their part to see who is for them and who is against them. And a lot of men go into church with the purpose of busting it up while pretending to be seeking God. Notice they said, for we seek your God. Pretending to be seeking the God of the Bible. Now Ezra 4.4, 4, Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. So the true colors show the fangs come out. It's like people at work. They many times don't work with you, but they'll work against you. Verse 5, And hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So they hired people just to mess them up. And I believe there are people getting paid big money to try and hurt the cause of Christ. Verse 6, And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah, against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Notice that the enemies of God, the enemies of God's people, write to King Artaxerxes, it, what they write is nothing but slander. Also notice that it makes the good guys look like the bad guys. And that's why the old preacher said when he preached against wolves in sheep's clothing, to many people he became a sheep in wolves clothing. Not every one who men portray as wicked are actually wicked or rebellious. It's actually the other way around. Many people will portray a good man as a bad man. And in verse 12 and 13 it says, Be it known unto the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are coming to Jerusalem, building the rebellious and the bad city, and have set up the walls thereof, and joined the foundations. Be it now known, be it known now unto the king, that if this city be builded, and the walls set up again, then will they not pay toll, tribute, and custom? And so thou shalt in damage the revenue of the kings. So this letter of lies caused the work to cease. In verse 23 and 24 it says, Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshah the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem and to the Jews and made them to seize by force and power. Then seized the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem. So it seized into the second year of the reign of Darius king of Persia. Now notice in chapter 5 you're going to see two familiar characters. Haggai and Zechariah. In Ezra 5, 1 and 2, it says, Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem, in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. So you see Haggai and Zechariah having have their own books of the Bible. And they prophesied during the time of Ezra. Knowing these little facts will really help you with the timeline of your Bible. But Tatnai the governor attempts to stop them from building the house. But it says in Ezra 5.5, 5, The eye of God was on the elders of the Jews, that they could not cause them to see. So Tatnai the governor sends a letter to King Darius telling him to find out if there was a decree from King Cyrus to allow the rebuilding of the house of God. And in 517, it says, Now therefore, if it seem good to the king, let there be search made in the king's treasure house, which is there at Babylon, whether it be so that a decree was made of Cyrus the king to build this house of God at Jerusalem, and let the king send his pleasure to us concerning this matter. So in chapter 6, you see that Darius does find the decree. In Ezra 6, 1 through 3, it says, Then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rolls, 
where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there was found at Agmetha in the palace that is in the province of the Medes a roll, and therein was a record thus written, In the first year of Cyrus the king, the same Cyrus the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem, let the house be builded, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let all let the foundations thereof be strongly laid. Now Tatnai has to help with the finances of building the temple and give the Jews anything they need, so it comes back to bite him. So it says in thirteen in verse fourteen, then Tatnai governor on this side of the river, Shethar Bosnai and their companions, according to that which Darius the king had sent, so they did speedily, and the elders of the Jews built it, and they prospered through prophesying of Hag proffered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, and they built it and finished it, according to the commandment of the God of Israel, and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Then in chapter six they finish building the temple. <clears throat> And it says in Ezra 6.14 that they pro prospered through the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. And you'll always prosper through preachers, listening to preaching. Get as much preaching as you can while it's still out there. Download it, put it on USBs, put it on the, the flash drives. And just listen to it through the week. Go to church, listen to it there while you still can. And now Ezra is going to finally show up in chapter 7. Verse 6 says, This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all his request, according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And Ezra 7.10 shows us that Ezra was a student of the word of God, it says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So Ezra is sent to teach the people. Ezra gave attendance to reading. And in verse 25 it says, And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. Ezra is a ready scribe. He gave attendance to reading. He studied to show himself approved unto God. And through the book of Ezra, Ezra uses phrases to show that he thought highly of God's words. Like I said, he is a Bible man. For example, in chapter 1 and verse 1, he says the word of the Lord. In 3, 2, he calls, calls it the law. In 6.14, he says the commandments of the God of Israel. In 6.18, he says the book of Moses. In 7.14, he says the law of thy God. In 9.4, he says the words of the God of Israel. In chapter 10, 3 and 5, chapter 10, verses 3 and 5, he says, and the commandments of God. So, at the beginning of chapter 8, you see a list of people that returned from Babylon to Jerusalem with Ezra. And in this chapter, we also see a great thing about Ezra. And that is the fact that he is a man of prayer and fasting. Ezra 8.21 says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. Notice he said to seek of him a right way for us so you can count on God and his word to show you the right way more than you can count on GPS or Google Maps or the map app on your phone. Ezra 8, 22 through 23 says, For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated for us. So they get a hold of God. And in chapter 9, Ezra prays to the Lord about Israel, having taken wives of the heathen. As you know, God's against them taking wives from the heathen lands. 
In Ezra 9, 5 and 6, it says, And at the evening sacrifice I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell up on my knees, and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed, and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Notice he's ashamed. One of the signs of the last days is that men are unashamed of how wicked they are. So don't ever lose your embarrassment over your sin or over other people's sin. That's a dangerous shape to get into. And he says in verse 7, Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass against thee unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. Notice he takes responsibility. He doesn't make excuses for God's people. He lets the Lord know it's their fault, and their fault alone. That's what you need to do when you come before God. Let them know everything is your fault, and don't place the blame on everyone else. You're responsible for your own decision. Now, verse 8, And now, for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God, to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in, this, in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. And now we see in chapter 10 that the people confess their sin of taking strange wives. In verses 11 through 12 it says, Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, and do his pleasure, and separate yourselves from the people of the land, and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. Today you need to make sure you marry a believer in the Lord. And not only a believer, but a believer that acts like a believer. The Christian life is hard enough without marrying a lost man or a lost woman. So if you're dating someone that's that's lost and you're saved, then you either need to get them saved and get them acting like they're saved before you marry them, or you need to get away from that person and marry someone who is saved. Because, like I said, the Christian life is hard enough without being married to a lost person. And God doesn't want you to marry a lost person. But this has been a study on the book of Ezra. This has been an overview of the book of Ezra. And hopefully it got you interested in the book enough to go and read it. It's only 10 chapters. And I just feel like you'll get a lot out of reading this book.